to the CBA Leaders Podcast, a resource provided for ministry leaders serving churches and the Chilton Baptist Association. Our association exists to strengthen and connect churches to complete the Great Commission. The goal of this podcast is to provide news and announcements related to associational ministries and to provide helpful content to encourage you in your ministry leadership as you serve to make disciples of Jesus in Chilton County and beyond. Thanks again for listening. Let's jump into this week's episode. Hey everyone, welcome to this week's episode of the CBA Leaders Podcast. I'm going to keep my comments short here because we're going to have a longer than usual episode on this week's podcast because as usual, we want to post and share our content from our monthly Lunch and Learn. For those of you that were not be able to be here in attendance, I want you to still be able to benefit from the awesome content that we received in that Lunch and Learn uh, today, and I want to share that with you. So because of that, it's a little bit longer podcast than usual, so I want to be brief and jump right into the content here in just a minute. But do want to remind you about one upcoming event in the life of the association to serve the churches of the Chilton Baptist Association. We have upcoming VBS clinic. As we all know, VBS is one of the most strategic opportunities for your church to reach out, develop relationships with people in your community to make a difference in their life and bring the message of the gospel, not just to their kids, but to their entire family. And so awesome opportunity. We want to do it with excellence and to the best of our ability with the resources that God has given us. And so we're offering this VBS clinic as an opportunity, a free opportunity, um, thanks to your giving through the association, that we can provide this and uh, have some training for you to be equipped and reminded. Some of you may have been teaching for VBS for 30 years, uh, but still good to come and get a refresher and a reminder as you go into VBS if that's you, but uh, maybe a good thing to send new teachers to, or uh, if you got a new VBS director, you'll see there's a director's breakout that's available. And also, as I reminded you previously, uh, we're also not just doing the Lifeway curriculum, but we're also doing Answers in Genesis. Uh, curriculum as well and have classes offered for for that also so this is going to be on march 14th that is this week march 14th at 6 30 p.m to 8 30 p.m at west end baptist church we're also going to have some awesome door prizes to give away so you'll want to be there to have your name in the hat to potentially um, win some of those awesome door prizes to help you out on your budget with vbs you'll hopefully get some good stuff that might help offset some of the expenses that you have as a church so anyway look forward to seeing you there hope you'll be there on march 14th to participate in that and um, so for this week's episode of the podcast we have dr kevin blackwell who is at sanford university and gives oversight uh, to the ministry training institute and uh, is also uh, assistant to the president. He does a lot of things. Kevin wears a lot of hats. And um, uh, he shared with us in uh, our Lunch and Learn today about the issue of calling out the call, the importance of that. And not just that, but gave some strategic ideas of things that we can do in order to uh, see you know, a, a, a change in this area, the shortage that we kind of seem to be having in so many churches when it comes to people stepping into vocational ministry. And so um, just want to let you know, there will be a link in the show notes and on the video portion on YouTube uh, where you can go and you can get a link to the document that Kevin shared with us that has some of these notes on it, as well as there is a link to a online course uh, called Exploring Your Call that you can look at there. If you know someone in your church that's struggling or thinking or considering a call to vocational ministry, then that online course is there to give you some kind of tracks to run on with that person to help them explore their calling to ministry uh, and see if that really is where God is leading them. So that's all for announcements this week. I'm going to uh, jump on now and play the recording for you from our time uh, with uh, Dr. Blackwell today and hope that you find a blessing in the content uh, as much as we did uh, here in person live with it this morning. To be with you, brothers. Tyler, thank you again for the invitation to address your pastors. And uh, the attendance may have something to do with the speaker today. I, I have a feeling. but uh, So uh, just know uh, it'll improve next month probably. But, uh, uh, man, just really uh, grateful for Tyler and your friendship. Um, I just I also want to bring you greetings on behalf of our president, Dr. Beck Taylor at Sanford. Uh, just, a, just a really quick Quick brief update about Sanford. 
Um, we are seeing some amazing things happening on our campus right now. We're involved in two of the largest um, capital projects in university history. Uh, we are um, uh, nearing the completion, and it will happen in August, of our new Wellness and Recreation Center, which is a brand new building, uh, significant updates, updates to Cybert Hall, which has been around, you know, since Moses was in college. Um, <laughs> And needed it looked like you stepped into Rydell High, you know, when you went to it. But um, uh, and also an update to Bashinsky, uh, which is next door to, to uh, Cyber. And so those have been are, are in the process of being gutted and kind of redeployed with a whole new look, along with a new uh, building which is directly behind Cyber, which uh, protrudes onto the um, uh, end zone of our football stadium, and it's going to give us. Uh, some covered uh, area for our football team as well to practice uh, during inclement weather. Um, that will be that will be completed by the end of August, and we will officially open it on Parents Weekend, uh, which will be uh, somewhere around the third week of September. Um, we also uh, broke ground recently on uh, new residence halls at Sanford, the Central Campus Resident Hall, which will be for freshmen. Um, we're adding uh, new residence halls for upper-class Greek students in our West Campus. And essentially, we're adding 650 new beds for, for, uh, for students, uh, which will help us to uh, reach some of our enrollment goals that we've set for the next 10 years. Uh, we will likely uh, meet the 6,000 enrollment mark at Sanford for the, for the first time in our 183 history uh, this next year. So really significant growth that we've seen. We've had 13 consecutive enrollment records on, for our uh, university. And so God just got his hand on our place and just really, uh, really grateful for all that's going on there. So I'm told we've got almost $190 million worth of capital projects going on right now. So you thought you were all facing some significant financial challenges, uh, but uh, uh, we're, we, we certainly are, but uh, God's been faithful and will continue to be faithful to help us to steward our finances as well. Um, I've been privileged to uh, be a part of the Christian Ministry Department at Sanford University since its inception in 2018. Uh, Dr. Scott Guffin is our chair. Um, Scott and I have been working hand in uh, hand to hand, um, uh, looking at that curriculum, building that curriculum. Just a quick update on that. Uh, we've got right at 80 students in our program now that are majoring and minoring training uh, for ministry. Uh, it, we have, if you've ever been discouraged or you find yourself discouraged about the next generation, I would love to bring you to my Christian leadership class that I teach every week and to see and meet my 27 students. Uh, I'm telling you, if I was going to attack hell tomorrow, I'd grab every one of those kids and I would go with it. I'm telling you, they are phenomenal young folks. And there's the future uh, of ministers and ministry leaders and missionaries. Um, God's doing a significant work there. So keep praying um, for that. Uh, we are in search of a new faculty member who should be in place by the, um, probably by the end of the spring for a July 1st start date for that. But uh, blessed to be a part of that team and what God's doing there. Um, Ministry Training Institute, as you know, has been around uh, for 76 years. Uh, we're blessed to have a classroom here in Chilton County. Uh, Tyler has stewarded that so well uh, since he became the Associational Mission Strategist here uh, to bring us back uh, here to uh, kind of recapture the heart of what it looks like to do um, theological and ministry training within an associational um, uh, context. And uh, man, uh, Tyler has done a great job. He, of course, is our lead instructor as well, which often means that he's um, probably tired of developing lectures, frankly. Uh, uh, he's been mainly our uh, one of our only teachers here, so uh, we would love to have uh, some of you to be a part of our faculty. But Kent Dodson is teaching right now for us uh, the uh, epistles of Peter, and then Tyler will uh, pick back up again at the end of this month uh, with a class on the um, doctrine of prayer. And uh, so that's coming up. So we encourage your folks to be part of that. We'll be using Keller's book on prayer for that class. And so if you haven't read uh, Keller's book on prayer, it's a significant, uh, it'll, give you, it'll give you a significant theological boost on your prayer life. I promise you that. So uh, Tyler, thank you for allowing us to be a part of your program here and your association here. And um, our, our enrollments have continued to be very consistent at the Chilton County site. And uh, that's encouraging. So uh, great. Just a quick update on MTI. Um, as you probably are already uh, aware, 
Um, no one was doing extension work academically in Baptist higher education in America until Howard College stepped up uh, to the plate, now Sanford University in 1947. Uh, under the uh, initial leadership of Dr. Gilbert Guffin, the uh, Howard College Extension was birthed um, in, in, on January 1st, 1947. So we've been doing it for a long time. We've been doing it um, uh, before anybody else did it. We're a pioneer with that, with, with that whole idea. And uh, things are still going very well today. Just kind of give you a quick update on that. We've got uh, 43 active locations now that I oversee as director of that program. We um, started four new locations this spring semester. Uh, one of those is in Kenai, Alaska. Uh, and that really developed through the partnership that this, the Alaska Baptist Resource Network has with our state convention. I traveled up there uh, this past October with a team from the Shelby Association to train pastors. I and Tim Cox and, and uh, Rick Camp um, and Jason Jarvis, who's, in, who's at Clara. Uh, did some pastoral training, and um, one of the stops was in the Kenai Peninsula. Uh, we had over 20 uh, show up for the training on that peninsula alone, which I was very encouraged by that. So I trained the pastors on disciple making, and out of that was birthed a new site uh, when they said, you know, the biggest thing we need around here is theological training. We just don't have any. And I thought, well, I know a guy. Uh, so, uh, so, we, so we launched that, and we got 15 students in our first term there. Um, our biggest site right now is also a brand new site, and that's at the Big Emory Association in Harriman, Tennessee. Uh, they had 31 students the first term uh, there in Big Harriman, uh, or Big Emory in Harriman, Tennessee. So uh, grateful for the work that's going on there. We also started a site in Baldwin County as well, and in Asheville with the St. Clair Association, which gives us two sites in St. Clair County. Um, so all that's going well. So far, we've taken in uh, almost 2,100 enrollments this academic year through the program. So it's a sizable effort. I tell everyone, I, sometimes I feel like I'm the president of a small college with that because of all the things that's going on. It's just crazy. Uh, so uh, we, um, I've had three uh, associations from the state of Tennessee reach out to me last week, three in a week, for a new location in the fall. So uh, it's just crazy what God's doing with that. So uh, thank you for your support for that. If you want to know more about our program, that brochure there in front of you will explain that. First page, you'll find our diploma courses, and that's what we're offering through all of our extension sites. You see all 32 of the courses that we're offering. Uh, and then on the second page, you see our, our online certificates, which we continue to expand those offerings to. We're now up to five online certificates. Those are only available online through Canvas. Um, and students uh, kind of walk through that. Um, it's somewhat self-paced, an asynchronous approach. Um, and Justin has been a part of that certificate program, so he can speak to the uh, quality of it. Uh, so uh, I hope you'll encourage your people to be a part of the diploma program here that, that we're offering on Tuesday evenings at the association office in this very room. Um, but also with our online certificate programs too, you see those five subjects. We are training worship leaders, we are training disciple makers, we are training pastors through our pastoral leadership certificate, and we're training women, women's leadership um, offerings there, women's leaders, no doubt. We're doing a great job training that with Claudia Johnson, former IMB missionary that's training women to, to disciple women. So everything that we need, I think right now for the church, you're going to find it through what uh, Sanford Extension is, is doing through the Ministry Training Institute. All right. Any questions, just briefly, any questions about what we're doing through our extension program or about Sanford in general? Any questions? All right. Well, um, tune in to ESPN tonight. We play for the Southern Conference Championship tonight for a, um, for a bid to the, to the NCAA tournament. So we got to beat East Tennessee State tonight. So uh, you know, pulling for that. Uh, I'll be listening on the road. I've got to go to Troy when we're done here. I'm speaking there tonight. But uh, so hopefully we can bring that home. All right. Well, very good. Well, the reason that Tyler asked me to come here uh, today to speak with you is the, on the subject of calling out the call. Um, just to, some initial thoughts related to that. In, um, in the book, Calling Out the Called, which some of you have probably read that already, the authors brought out in the first chapter that the statistics are not moving in the right direction. In 1992, the median age of pastors was 44. 
That number today is uh, at 54. And uh, pastors under the age of 40 today is, makes up less than 15% of total pastors um, in Protestant churches in America. Matter of fact, we know today that there are more full-time pastors over the age of 65 than under the age of 40. So that you can look at that and you can see some of the trends that are taking place and you, you recognize pretty quick uh, that something's, something's got to give. I noticed today, just doing a little bit of uh, prep work for this talk today, that the, the AP reported a new survey recently that they took uh, in the fall of 2023. And that survey showed that four out of 10 pastors, four out of 10, so that they're seriously considering leaving their congregation and more than 50%, which I think is even more surprising, 50% have considered leaving the ministry since the pandemic, 50%. Significant numbers for sure. So when you think about the median age and kind of where we're at now, and you think about the number of pastors just that you know, just that you know, just maybe even within this association, who have retired recently, or maybe who have just dropped out for whatever reason. Not to mention the pastors uh, in uh, Protestant churches in America that have, ex that, that have uh, gone through a moral failure of some kind, that also have been forced to quit uh, of their own doing. Um, all of that, when you think about where we're at right now related to the number of pastors that are leaving or considering leaving the ministry, it's all creating kind of the perfect storm, isn't it, right now related to the, the lack of, of, of qualified and available men to fill the pulpits within our state. So why, why does this crisis exist? Well, that's one of the questions that we've been pondering uh, really since the beginning of 2023. To kind of give you a brief history of why I'm even talking about this day. Well, first of all, you know, I direct one of the largest ministry training programs in the Southeast, so there's that. Um, I'm also, you know, a faculty member of our Christian ministry department right now that's training undergrads, so I've I got kind of both views of that, where I'm training undergrads. Uh, I've you know, also been an adjunct with New Orleans in the past on the graduate part, and now I'm getting to be a part of training adults as well for ministry, so I've got a unique perspective on all that. However, Craig Carlisle, who is our current state convention president, uh, Craig reached out to me February of last year, about a year ago, and um, asked if he could come to campus and just sit down and chat as he has something on his mind. So I said, sure. So we blocked out of time, and, um, and uh, Scott Guffin, my colleague, uh, also blocked out some time to be part of that conversation. We weren't sure really what Craig wanted to talk about. Um, but we met him in our university center, and uh, Craig sat down with us at a table, and he looked at us, and he said, guys, he said, I don't, he said I've just got a problem. He said, I don't know what to do about it. He said, I just need some advice because I think you guys would have a good perspective on this. He said, I've been an associational missionary now for a few years. He said, and I'm continuing to face the same problem. I continue to have churches that have a lack of um, a pulpit supply every week or a pastor, and I don't have any, I don't have any resumes to give these churches anymore. He said, I don't know what to do about it. He said, the number of churches that need someone as a pastor or even as an interim or even more granular than that, someone to fill the pulpit. He said, those churches continue to increase in, in our association. And he said, every time I get those requests, I look down at the file and I open up the file and the resumes are not getting any, you know, number of resumes are not increasing. So while the demand is increasing, the number of people that I can pull from to say, yeah, I, I know a person, here's, here's a few names to think about, is not increasing. 
He said, what we're seeing in the Etowah Association is that we're seeing, a, a, I think, a crisis now, but I think it's going to be even more of a crisis in the future. He said, I just want to get ahead of it. He said, so I'm just kind of seeking your advice. So, you know, how, what do we do about this? Well, what Craig didn't know was he was, he was um, not the first associational mission strategist in the state that had talked to me about this very thing. As I travel around the state and speak and preach and, uh, and do some training, that's been a consistent conversation I've had, particularly with associational leaders, for, oh gosh, a good part of five years. But it's really expedited since COVID. It, it is taking it into hyper mode. And so Craig and I and Scott sat around for about two hours and just chatted about it. And I talked to Craig about the things that I, were, well, I was hearing around the state, the things that I had experienced around the state, and the things that, that I was receiving as well, because I was constantly getting phone calls as well, and emails, text messages from people around the state wanting to know, did I know someone um, who would serve in fill-in-the-blank role? And it's rare that I have a name, honestly. That includes youth ministry. That includes uh, worship uh, leaders as well, um, and, and of course pastors, bivocational in particular. There is just not a lot of people right now. And so uh, by the time we were done there with our talk with Craig, I made the suggestion that uh, because I know Craig's issues and his association are uh, ubiquitous across the state, I made the suggestion that we pull together some of the larger associational leaders in the state of Alabama and just have a talk. I said, Craig, you're saying things that I'm hearing from other state, state leaders. Why don't, we, why don't I make a contact to these guys and let's set a date and let's just bring everybody together. And we did that. And so June of 23 at Sanford, I brought together Craig. I brought together Neil Hughes. I brought Neil Hughes to campus, who's in Montgomery. Uh, I brought Chris Crane to campus at the Birmingham Association. Uh, we, we brought uh, also in that conversation uh, 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 Ken Allen from State Board of Missions to be a part of that uh, conversation. Jeff Knight and the Tuscaloosa Association, we brought him to be a part of that conversation uh, as well. Um, and, and just kind of looking at, you know, what, what is this... What does this look like in your context? You know, how, how, does this, how is this kind of fleshing out in, in your area? In every one of them. And I just sat there. I just brought those guys together, and I just kind of set the stage and set the conversation, and I just kind of backed off. And I sat there and watched these DOMs just talk. And what I realized was these guys need to talk about this. They, it's almost like misery loves company in a sense. <laughs> You know, that's what was happening in that room. Like, yeah, let me tell you what's, let me tell you what's happening in, you know, Montgomery. I've had this church down in Pentlala that's been open for five years and, and I, I don't have any more names to give them, you know, whatever. Yeah, I, I get it. I mean, I've got a, I've got a church down here in Northport, you know, and I, I really struggled for the longest time to find anyone to, to, to take that association, you know, and I'm like, gosh, man, these guys... They're all facing the same things. So after about, no kidding, an hour or so, them guys just sitting around talking and just kind of, frankly, sharing, sharing stories, um, I said, guys, we, we, need to, we need to really think about this and together collectively agree to start meeting on a regular basis and let's do something about it. I mean, here's the thing. When Ronnie Floyd was, uh, was the CEO of the Southern Baptist Convention, you know, Dr. Floyd put together his 2025 vision. Y'all remember his 2025 vision? You, do you remember one of the major points of the 2025 vision? Calling out the call. And then, of course, we know the rest of the story. It didn't end well. And with, uh, with uh, you know, the, the, uh, the situation with which happened with Dr. Floyd, and I'm still not sure all that, and I only know, I'm not going to speak on that, but what I do know was that that became a casualty 
of whatever happened with Ronnie Floyd. And so once Dr. Floyd stepped out of the picture and we've had this void of leadership there at the executive committee, which hopefully that's about to be a remedy, thank God, um, here we go. Which, by the way, um, it was not lost on me that the, um, the leader of the search committee was in our cohort, <laughs> Neil Hughes. So, uh, well done, Neil, getting Jeff Orge. Hope they vote him in. Um, but anyway, that became a casualty of it. So now all of a sudden, nobody's talking about it. And um, I said, you know, guys, I just kind of feel like that God's brought us together for such a time as this. We, we need to start talking about this. Why not talk about it? Why not together, collectively, develop a strategy for, first of all, your associations and thus your churches, and then for the state convention. And so we just kind of felt like that's what God had called us together for. That this was bigger than what Craig was facing in Etowah. It was bigger than what I was hearing, you know, when I was visiting down in, I don't know, the Barber Association or wherever I was going to be at that week. This was really a statewide issue. And in talking to Tyler, same thing in Chilton County. So why not tackle the issue? So on that day in June of 2023, we decided that we would make this a priority. So we slowly began to pull in some other guys from across the state to talk about, you know, what this needed to look like. Uh, we have met now uh, for four times, and uh, through our meetings, we have put together uh, this strategy. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to hand out to you what, what are the four priorities that this team is, uh, has talked about, if y'all don't mind passing those around. And while you're doing that... Let me just share with you just my own thoughts related to um, why we even have a crisis in the first place, okay? What I have experienced in my own ministry is over the past two decades, over the past two decades, churches have spent more time in survival mode than they have in the equipping mode. And I think because of that, I think because so many churches have been, particularly since COVID, since the pandemic, since so many churches have just kind of stopped a lot of things they're doing and, and they've just kind of had to kind of galvanize in a sense and just kind of take care of their own things and look more at finances and think about how do they get people back in church again and, you know, all the things that come along with the pandemic. That one of the casualties was that we have stopped equipping people for ministry. I've seen it. I'm sure that you have seen it as well. And I think it has resulted in, uh, in the crisis we have now. The crisis was building even before COVID. We know that. But COVID, as it's done everything else, has exacerbated it. So I think that's one of the things. I think, two, we have stopped, and I mean we, we as pastors, we have stopped from the pulpit calling out the cult. We don't preach sermons like that anymore. We, we have, we, we're not mentioning it like we used to mention it. I mean, I remember back in the day that pastors consistently talked about this from the pulpit, the need to find who that was in their, in their sanctuary that day and to remind them that, you know what, God's got His hand on you and you need to respond in obedience to that. There was a kind of a calling out. Sometimes, I don't know why, but it seems like lately we get kind of sheepish on that. and We shouldn't be sheepish on that. We don't hear as many sermons as we used to on this subject. We're not preaching on it. We're not talking about it within our ecclesial circles. And we need to be. Number three, I think that there is a lack of mentoring and disciple-making relationships within our churches. When you look at the churches that Paul writes to in the New Testament, you, consistent, you consistently see Paul encouraging his churches to develop a mentor-mentee 
culture within those New Testament churches. Constantly. We certainly see that in 2 Timothy 2 too, do we not? <laughs> invest these truths in the faithful man who would invest in faithful men. We certainly see evidence that even in John's epistles, particularly in 3 John, John is encouraging men by name in that epistle to go and encourage other people. Thus, I discipled you, you disciple more. I would even say it was a core value of the New Testament church in biblical days to create cultures of what I would refer to as a spiritual corporate elevation. That we are not just uh, grabbing you know, programs and, and throwing them in the face of our people, asking our people to sign up. But rather, we are lifting up the entire ecclesial body corporately together to say, to take on the old, you know, uh, spirit of the Marine Corps, no man left behind. We literally are creating a corporate elevation spiritually within our churches. Not just a fiery sermon where we get people fired up for a day or two and only to have them come back the next Sunday and need to, you know, reinvigorate their spiritual walk again. But rather we, we, we keep folks here and we continue to remind them to be here and we create within our churches um, a culture in which no one's left behind. And this comes back to this idea of disciple making. Because we have not been focused on making disciples who make disciples in our churches, but rather attracting the crowds, coming up with the next greatest programs, I think we are getting the fruit, frankly, that we have not grown in our churches. And I think fourth, we have pastors that have been occupied with member care, post-pandemic ministry reconstruction, filling staff vacancies to the neglect of finding their next Timothys. And I get it, right? I get it. I'm there. I'm still serving part-time on a church staff. We're facing some of the similar things as well. So no stones are being thrown, but that's just the reality. And, and we've got to return back to this thought of you, pastor, have to be thinking about who your Timothy is. Who is your Titus? Who is that person that God has called you to walk alongside to bring to a place where they're ready to serve? Here's what I do know. God is not done calling people to ministry. God is still calling people to serve in vocational ministry. And let's just say that, you know, all of our people in our churches have a call to ministry. Everyone. Everyone has an obligation to serve in ministry, but not everyone is called to an occupation in ministry. All are served, all are called to serve as an obligation, but not all as an occupation. But yet there are some who are being called to serve in a ministry occupation. God's still calling people. What we've got to do within our churches is create cultures that make it as easy as possible and an encouraging atmosphere for those people to hear the voice of God and respond to that voice. We've got to make it as easy as possible. What does that look like in your church right now? Like, What does that look like in your pocket of influence as a pastor. And I think finally, more and more young people, what I've experienced is more and more young people who've experienced a call or choosing a different route other than pastoral ministry too. That's an issue. Some younger people now are going into parachurch type situations. Some, uh, and frankly many, are wanting to be church planters in pioneer areas. And what's happening is, particularly in the Deep South, the rural churches of Chilton County are being jumped over for these more attractive opportunities, right? Where that grass looks a little bit greener and then you realize it's not quite as green as it should be. Or there's, right, there's, there's a reason why it's green and it may be fertilizer. 
right? And so that's one of the things we're doing at Sanford right now with our Christian ministry department is we're really trying to emphasize the local church and the importance of the local church so that our students understand the need to start there, start there. God's calling you there to serve. But I think all these things, and I just gave you four things that I think are um, the reasons why we have kind of an epidemic issue related to this, okay? So in front of you, you have the bones of the calling out the call strategy. Let me just kind of go over those. Again, um, this, is, um, this is not just about me. This is about a group that met together and uh, prioritized uh, four what I would call kind of supporting legs of a great strategy. It was Neil Hughes that brought up um, this idea of asking pastors, who are your three? Who are your three? Well, what does that mean? What Neil means is, Pastor, who are your three people right now that you are influencing to serve the local church? Who are your three? Who are those people? Who are your warriors you're training for battle right now? There was a time when that was a priority. Today, because the pastoral tasks make us busy with other things, this is frankly taking a back seat. So we're just trying to get you to, to, to kind of personalize this, to look at pastors and say, who are your three? Who are those people in your life? So our overarching strategic goal for the Calling Out the Call strategy is to increase the number of ministers statewide by assisting biblically qualified people in recognizing, responding, and preparing to accept their call to ministry. Now, in order to fulfill that task, uh, this group is going to recommend, let me just give you these priorities and goals. I've left the initiatives off because, frankly, they are still very fluid right now. Um, but let me just go over the priorities. Number one, we agree before anything else can happen that we've got to pray for the called. We've got to pray for the called. We are taking here Matthew 9, 37 and 38, when Jesus said to his disciples, the harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Therefore, pray earnestly to the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. Now, it's, that's an interesting phrase that Jesus uses right there because Jesus doesn't say, guys, I want you to go find more laborers for the harvest. That's not what he says. What does he say? Pray for it. So in other words, it's not just about us going and beating the bushes hoping a pastor falls out. Jesus says, before you do that, pray to the Lord of the harvest. So we're just trying here to take Jesus at His word to say, we can talk about the lack right now of people that we have within our state to fill pulpits. We can talk about that. We can bemoan it. But we first need to ask the hard question, how vigilantly, how earnestly are we praying to the Lord of the harvest that laborers will be sent? Nothing will be accomplished without prayer. We know that. Now that seems, that sounds like a great thing to say spiritually. But practically speaking, is it really happening? Do we know how to pray? And how many of you in your local church right now have this on the top of your prayer list? Pray, pray that the Lord of the harvest would send out laborers. How many of you have that as a top priority for your people on your Wednesday night prayer meetings? It should be. Because Jesus has commanded His church to pray for that. And so what we want to do as a, as a group is we want to encourage our churches to begin praying for that again, but also we want to encourage our associations to lead the way, and we want to encourage our state convention to remind our associations or remind our churches consistently of the need pray for it. What if in 2025 we make the entire year 
all about that very thing. That for the entire year, all we do is focus on praying that the Lord would send out more laborers. That becomes a priority for every church in your county. I think God can do something with that, and I think He will. So one of the, one of the things we're looking at right now is how do we develop a How to Pray for the Called website as a resource? That's going to happen in 2025. Another thing we're looking at is a, a calling out the call statewide Sunday prayer emphasis as well, planning that. It'll be pushed through the state convention to the associations, into the churches. And also what we hope to do is to distribute many, of resor- many, of, many resources, including a book I've already references, referenced, the Calling Out the Called book by Pruitt and Pace, giving emphasis to those things. Frankly, we need to do a better job of sharing the facts of the crisis because uh, a crisis pre- precipitates prayer. And what are the facts? Well, here's the facts. We need to know that right now, as I'm talking to you, there are 521 churches in the state of Alabama that are currently uh, without pastors. 90% of the total churches without pastors have a total attendance of 75 or below. And that's from Ken Allen. That's not something that I pulled out of the air. Okay, This is from our state convention. I just saw Ken in February at a meeting and asked him, what do those numbers look like now? He said, we're pretty much still there. I said, okay, that's a significant number. I wonder if our folks know that. What if our pastors know that? What if our associational leaders know that? Well, they know it now because we talked about it in February with them. So number one, we've got to pray for the call. The second priority is to petition the called. After we spend time praying, now comes the petition. And of course, I'm reminded of Isaiah 6, 8 here when Isaiah says, I heard the voice of the Lord saying, whom shall I send and whom will go for for us? And I I would say to you that that question is still resonating. God is still asking that question. God has not stopped asking that question. Isaiah's question is still the question. I think God's voice is still in your church, in your association, in our convention, in our denomination. Who, who shall I send? Who is going to go for us? We've got a petition. That was God petitioning. We've got to, we've got to be ambassadors of God and petition on His behalf even within our local church. So how do we do that? How do we do that? Well, one of the goals that we've set up for petitioning the called is to create and cultivate an ecclesial culture of discipling people toward a calling. You say, what does that mean? Let me give you, let me give you a thought on what that means. At the church that I serve, we have implemented within our church a very strong disciple-making culture. I wouldn't say we're doing it better than anybody because I know that there are great discipling churches in our our, uh, state convention. I'm grateful for every one of them. But God's using our church right now to make disciples who are making disciples. And what I've seen in our church alone, I've seen young men surrender to the call to preach who came to our church got involved in a small group, and from that small group experience was brought aside for a 20-week intense discipling relationship with one of our staff members who have since surrendered to the call to preach. One of those is Will Little. Will right now is the youth pastor at, uh, at um, Indian uh, Springs Baptist Church and the Shelby Association. Came to our church. Uh, he was a... a, a a truck part supplier, still he is full time, but through being a part of that disciple making culture, God just began to work in his life, and now God's calling to preach. He'll be a senior pastor one day. I'm convinced of it. We have got. 
to create these cultures in our churches that disciple people toward a calling. We've got to do that. And if we don't do that, then the chances are we're going to have people who have a calling on their life who just haven't been brought to a place spiritually where they even recognize it. You say, well, that's not on us. That's on them. No, it's on us. It, every one of you in this room who experienced a call to ministry had someone who helped you to see your calling. Every one of you. Am I right? Who was it? Name them. What's their name? You hear the names? Those are the guys we need in our churches right now. And it all sprang from a discipling relationship. We've got to do that as we petition the call. And chances are all the names that you just mentioned at some point said to you, come on, man. <laughs> I see God's hand on you. Let's talk about that, right? It took that conversation. For me, it was Del Wood. The DOM and the Friendship Association, who in 1992 took me aside and said, God's hands on you. What are you doing about it? What? Yeah. It's time to get out of the net, nest. Let's go. We've got to have that type of relationship. He, we've got to petition. But also, we've got to maybe even develop and distribute sermon outlines to churches on this subject. You say, well, we got to preach more on calling out the called. Well, what if State Convention put together some things, some resources to send out to our churches to help them to do that? You say, well, I don't need any help developing a sermon on that. Well, I do. <laughs> I'm just going to be honest with you. I would love to see some of those resources. And that's the plan. But we also are hoping to start big to begin planning regional conferences throughout the state in cooperation with Alice Baum and local associations on how we petition the called as churches. That's another part of the strategy. So we're going to pray for the called. We're going to petition the called. But look at priority three. Now, we're going to, now we have to think about how we prepare the called. And that's 2 Timothy 2.15. When Paul challenges young Timothy, Timothy, I want you to do your best to present yourself to God as one approved worker who has no need to be ashamed to rightly handle the word of truth. Once these folks have been petitioned, once they recognize God's call, then we have a job to do. We have got to make sure that they can rightly handle the word of God. Thank God for people that walked alongside me early on in my calling to help me understand the gravity of the call. The, the weight of standing in front of people to say, thus saith the Lord. It's big. And so we've got to develop structures and to, to, to prepare these folks, to encourage and train ministers through a fostering, mentoring relationship. But also, I think we've also got to get back to celebrating license and ordinations and commissions. You know, it occurred to us as we were meeting together as a cohort to develop this strategy that we're not seeing as many ordination and licensing within our churches as we did at one time. Last year, I was asked to be a part of an ordination council. It was the first one that I've sat in in more than two years. Wow. We need to encourage that and we need to celebrate that more than we are in our state convention. But also, I think there's incredible opportunities to develop online training modules, which we've done that with MTI, but we've got to do that with State Convention. We can do it in a number of different ways. And I would just encourage you as, as a local church, have you created internship opportunities for younger people to walk alongside you to be a part of your ministry? You say, we don't have the budget. It doesn't take much. It doesn't. Develop these types of opportunities. Intentional. And number four, priority four. After we've prayed, after we've petitioned, after we've prepared, now we've got to place the called. 
Titus 1.5, certainly we see evidence of that, do we not? Where Paul says, for this reason I left you, Titus, in Crete, that you should set in order the things that are lacking and appoint elders in every city as I commanded you. That's still true today. We've got to continue to do that. Well, how do we do that? Well, we've got to create incubator churches. Let me tell you what I mean by that. I've been encouraged in a trend I've seen over the last couple of years to where um, pastors see the time of their retirement coming and rather than just to drop the bomb on their congregation, hey, I'm going to retire, good luck finding someone, they identify maybe even a potential new pastor and they mentor them and they disciple them and they give their church plenty of time, plenty of time to think through the next step. We're seeing this as a trend, particularly in the larger churches in the state and also within our convention to where we've got folks that are more kind of homegrown within our churches. And I think that's, I, I could even make the argument that was the biblical model, right? Instead of, I resign, I'm retiring, here's the committee, let's get some advertisements out, let's kind of see how many resumes we get, right? And then, you know, most of the resumes you look at, you're like, eh. But what if you were more intentional as a church to be able to set up an incubator process where you're growing leaders within your church and yeah, even the next pastor? Like, what would that look like? <laughs> you must be doing it at your church, don't you, Mark? <laughs> it's a, it is a great idea. It needs to happen for sure. So I think all that is extremely important. I'm grateful for Sanford and the University of Mobile as they continue to provide pathways for students and adults to serve local churches. We need to continue to do that. I can't speak for Mobile, but I can speak for Sanford to tell you we're, we are doing that. We'll continue to do that. And then to ask the question, how, how can the local church assisted by associations provide more opportunities for on-the-job training for placing the cult? How do, how do we do that? Sometimes getting that first church, man, it's a little intimidating. How do we make the own ramp a little bit bigger in a sense, right? So let me give you just finally, and we'll take some time for discussion here before we eat. Um, what is this going to look like? Well, these are the four, four priorities that we've put together. The goals are pretty well established. The initiatives are fluid and are being established. We met um, in November of 23 and did our initial presentation to some state, a, a few more state DOMs. In February, we took this presentation to the annual associational meeting, um, associational leader meeting at Shaco. We presented that to them. Tyler was there. The guys were able to give some input to the, the, uh, to the initiative. We'll be meeting next Tuesday with Dr. Lance to go over this. Dr. Lance has seen this but has not had the opportunity to give input to it who have that opportunity next Tuesday will sit in, the, in his boardroom down there in Prattville and we'll talk about it. And then after that, the goal will be um, to have continued discussion leading up to November at the state convention meeting uh, in Daphne to present this to state, to state convention, the gathered convention, okay? You'll see it from the stage. And the goal at that point would be, all right, 2025, this thing will be launched and you'll hear a lot about it as more resources will be developed to support it, okay? So that's what we're doing. We think it's important. We recognize the need for it, and I would be open to hear your thoughts on it now. What do you think?